thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed today's service. God is using the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in many people's lives, and we have heard numerous stories of life change. If God has used the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in your life, we would love to hear your story. Please email us at amen at lakesidechurch.ca. Great, great job. 
And that song talks all about joy, joy, joy. And that's what we've been looking at as we've worked our way through this letter that the writer Paul is in his in imprisonment, on a very uncertain future, could be execution, gone through lots of pain, raised to this church, a place called Philippi, and these people are being persecuted and uh, they're facing some very painful circumstances. And he writes a letter and it's all about joy. And Paul is encouraging them to find joy as he's encouraging us today. And so we're on that journey. That's where we've been the last number of weeks to find joy. Because joy is so much better than happiness. So much better than happiness. And I started last week, I said, there we go. Happiness comes and goes depending on our circumstances. But joy can be permanent no matter what is happening. Happiness comes and goes. It does. Happiness is dependent on happenings, and, and, and sometimes it can, it, it can go and disappear and evaporate. But joy has the potential of permanently being part of your being. And Paul said that there is this confidence that brings joy. He talks about these things that help find joy, a confidence that brings joy. And then we looked at a perspective that brings joy. And then we talked about the kind of relationships that bring joy. And he was talking about things that produce joy. And then he kind of shifts gears halfway in the, in the book and, and the key things that he's talking about. And he says, I don't want to talk about what produces joy. I want to talk about what robs joy, what steals joy from your soul. And last week, we talked about the whole idea of letting go of those things of our past. Because too often, we let the things of our past creep into the present and affect our future. And it robs us of joy. Something that happened yesterday or last week or last month or many years ago, we let creep back into the present. And it robs us of joy. And I said last week that your past isn't just your past. It's just being allowed to impact your present and future. You say, well, that's just my past. No, no, no. If we allow it to impact today and tomorrow, it's a problem. I said when who you were and what you did yesterday doesn't have to limit who you are today and can become tomorrow. You do not need to be stuck by the things of your past. You can be different. Things can be better. We, we said that there were four things that Paul kind of shared, that your biggest sinful choices are not too much for God's grace. No matter what you've done and how many times you've done it and how bad you think it is, God's grace is greater. God's grace is uh, greater. It is. And we need to hold on to that reality. Second thing I said was your past sin doesn't define you. It doesn't. Because it says that if we are in Christ, if we have that relationship with Jesus, we are a new creation. That's our identity. We are a new creation. And the things of our past are fading away, and behold, there are new things happening in our lives. And so past sin doesn't define us. Third thing I says is you can't change your past. That is so true, right? There's not a thing you can do about yesterday, last week, last month, last year. But Jesus can change your future. And it's not to look back, but it's to look forward and say, Jesus, guide me, lead me, direct me. Give me the kind of future that you want me to have. And then lastly, I said it takes the right mindset to let go of the past and to move into the future. And Paul says these words, live up or live according to what you've already obtained. So if you're a Christ follower, there are certain benefits you have from being a follower of Jesus. And he says, live up to them. Don't be like a Christian atheist where you believe them, but you don't live by them. He says, you know them and now live by them. And then I shared this quote as we closed. Beware of spending too much time looking back at what you once were when God wants you to become something you have never been. There's last week's message in tweet points. You're all set. So, we talked about getting rid of your, the things of your past, dealing with the stuff in your past, forgetting what is behind, because it robs of joy if we bring that into the present and into the future. And then Paul moves into two more joy robbers. There's, just as there were three principles, there's these three joy robbers. And next week we're going to look at one of them, and today we're going to look at the other. Now, last week you might have sat here and said, oh, I'm done with my past. It's in the past. And it's truthful. That's how you live. Maybe today or maybe next week will be one of those joy robbers that you struggle with. So next week we're going to look at the whole idea of discontentment. Discontentment, which I believe the current media has fueled in our soul that we need something different, something more, something better, something greater. Be this, do whatever, because we feel discontent and discontent discontentment has become a disease of epidemic proportions with many unforeseen consequences and it's stealing people's joy. So that's next week, something to look forward to. 
Today we're going to look at something else that I think is a joy robber. I know this is the number one joy robber in my life. It might be yours too. I'm going to put three words on the screen. They're kind of synonymous with one another. They all kind of fit together. See if any of these might rob you of joy. Worry, anxiety, fear. Worry, anxiety, fear. Those three words, pretty synonymous, they pretty much go together. And I got to be honest with you, these are the kind of things that steal my joy. When I'm worried about the future, when I'm anxious about tomorrow, when I have a fear of what could happen, it robs me of joy. It robs me of joy. And that might be true of you too, because I think to varying degrees, there isn't a person in this room who has never battled with worry or anxiety or fear. So some of you battle a lot, and some of you, it's an intense battle. But we've all battled with this. And I think the one word that kind of summarizes all three of these words that are synonymous is this word. It's the word anxiety. It is the word anxiety. Anybody here but me wrestle with anxiety at all, ever? Don't raise your hands. Not confession time. Ever feel overwhelmed by it? Ever feel so overwhelmed? Do you ever have trouble falling asleep or going back to sleep when you wake up in the middle of the night? Because, because of anxiety? Are you, anxi are you anxious because of the future? Something you're afraid of? Maybe it's something to do with your job. Or finding a job or whatever, but you're anxious about it. Or maybe it's something to do with, um, your, with money, the, you know, the debt you carry or financial pressures or whatever, and you feel anxious because of money. Or maybe it's because of something in the relational world. Maybe you're anxious about your marriage relationship or you're anxious about one of your kids because they're kind of off the charts and going in the wrong direction. And they're making choices that seem destructive, and you're so anxious about that. Or maybe it's something to do with a health issue. Maybe, you know, you've gone for some tests and you're kind of waiting for the results and you don't know what they're going to be and you're kind of nervous and anxious and worried and fearful about it. Or maybe you have this long-term condition and you've been struggling and you just wonder, is today the day I wake up and feel the pain all over again because it comes and goes? Maybe some of you are anxious about school. Maybe about papers you have to write or exams you, have, you need to take or a dissertation that you've got to get in by a deadline. I know that one. Or maybe just kind of a anxious about graduating altogether. But what is it in your future, or what is it that you are anxious about? What are you uncertain about? What seems to be negative and filling you with anxiety? What is it? Maybe, you know, lately, you know, you felt some of the weight that anxiety puts on us. Maybe you've experienced more headaches, digestive problems, maybe a couple mild panic attacks. My guess is all of us know the physical, mental, emotional toll that anxiety can have upon us. Most of us have experienced some degree of anxiety. So here's what I want to ask. What's creating fear? What's creating worry? What's creating anxiety in your life right now? Can you name it? Do you know what it is? How many of you have this joy bucket that you want to fill with joy, but it's got holes in it because of anxiety and worry and fear? How many of us? And today we're going to deal with this subject of anxiety because Paul deals with it in the next section of the letter. And we're going to look at the topic of anxiety. But I'm going to tell you, I don't speak as an expert, but more of one who's experienced anxiety to the point of a major emotional and mental breakdown. Some of you have been there. You know what that feels like. I do too. I'm just going to share my story in a, into and out of debilitating anxiety. And maybe you'll never get to the point that I got to. Praise God that you don't. I would pray that you would never get there because it's so dark and so awful. But the principles I'm going to share, no matter how deep your anxiety, worry, or fear is, are practical. They are principles and a pathway provided by Paul that helps us move from anxiety to joy. So I'm going to make a few comments. I'm going to share my story. And then we're going to look at this scripture and how it helps us deal with anxiety. So let's define anxiety first. Anxiety, the dictionary says, it's, it means to be distracted, to be divided in, 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 in an inner division, to be pulled apart. It's about apprehension, uncertainty. It's about being out of control. It's about fear. I think the words apprehension, uncertainty, out of control, and fear really kind of dominate what we think anxiety is all about. But I thought I would put a definition together, and I, 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 kind of this is my de definition. It kind of fits with where we went last week. Last week we said the past was bringing your past into the present. Well, anxiety is allowing the uncertainty and fears of your tomorrow to impact your today. That's really what it is. 
You are allowing the uncertainty and the fears of what's going to happen tomorrow, and you bring them into today, and you let them affect today, and you affect the, it affects the joy. You know, most of the things that you are fearful right now, worrying about, uncertain and anxious about, most of them will never happen. In fact, one stat says about 90% of what we fear or worry about never happens ever happens. But think of the energy wasted and the joy that evaporates when we bring the tomorrow into today. So, what do you think the opposite of anxiety is? Yell it out. Anybody think they know the opposite of anxiety? There's no wrong answer. Well, there is. There's only one right answer. What do you think the opposite of anxiety is? Yell it out. Ah, uh, you thought because the series about joy, it was joy. Wrong. What? No. Peace. I heard somebody say it over there. Yeah, you get, bring her the prize. No, no, just kidding. There's no prize. Um, the, the opposite of anxiety is peace. It's peace. It's that word shalom, which is much deeper than the way we use peace today. Shalom is the Bible word. And shalom is about tranquility and, and being undivided and wholeness and soundness of spirit, a sense of well-being, prosperity, health, freedom from inner strife. That sounds like the opposite to anxiety to me. Like peace is about, you know, calming the battle inside you, the turmoil and stress inside you. It's the exact opposite to anxiety. And we have this continuum, and at one end of the continuum, we have anxiety, debilitating, life-altering anxiety at one end. It's terrible there. And at the other end, way down the other end of the spectrum, we have peace. And the goal is to move from wherever we are in the spectrum, because all of us are somewhere between those two, a little closer to peace, because when we find that peace, its twin brother joy travels with it. Peace and joy travel together. Now, I know some of you are more predisposed to anxiety than others. I'm one of those. It's like your spiritual gift. It's like your DNA. And for me and for those like me, anxiety is a constant battle. And you look at others and go, Man, they have these occasional bouts, but man, I, I feel it every day. I mean, I go to bed feeling anxious, I wake up feeling anxious, and sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm anxious. And sometimes it's less than others, but often it feels chronic. And some anxiety is chronic because there are these biomedical realities in your body chemistry. Something's screwed up in your body chemistry. And when it's like that, we have to use medication as one of God's ways. Medication is one of God's ways to deal with your anxiety. If you were a diabetic, you would take insulin. When you have a problem with your, some kind of a mental illness, which deep-seated anxiety is, you take medicine. They both do the same thing. They're both worried about body chemistry. Let me be clear as I, can, as I can, using medication to deal with anxiety and depression, because they go hand in hand, is not a lack of faith. Don't let anybody ever tell you that. You're not a faith failure because you take medication. Medication allows you to build a foundation so that you can deal with the real issues that are at the root of your anxiety. I got to tell you, my faith is stronger today than it has been in a long time, and I take medication for anxiety. I'm not ashamed of it. I don't try to hide it, and neither should you be. Neither should you be. It's important. It's not a lack of faith. Now, let me start with my story. I'll take you back 38 years in about 38 seconds. No, it takes a little longer than that. 38 years of my working life. I don't know, maybe it's because of my makeup, but I've always picked very stressful jobs. Very, very stressful jobs. Marketplace and ministry. In my first job, it was so stressful as I climbed the ranks of that company that I developed irritable bowel syndrome. It was incredibly painful, all because of what? Anxiety. It was this boss I had, creating this anxiety. And for the next 38 years, my system constantly lived on adrenaline. I'd become an adrenaline junkie. And I'd slow down for a few days. I'd go on holidays. I'd take some time off. And I felt lousy. I felt awful. You know why? Because I was suffering withdrawal of adrenaline because I needed it to survive, and the flow had stopped because I got so used to living in it, uh, living on it. In the last couple of years, I got to tell you, have been the most stress-filled, difficult years of my whole working life. And to cope with the stress that I was experiencing and all that was going on, adrenaline flowed even in greater amounts. And I noticed over the last couple of years, but in the last six months, my anxiety was continuing to increase. I started seeing some cracks in my life, and they were appearing, and I thought, something's not right. 
I was sleeping less, I had heart palpitations, I had irritable bowel syndrome again, I was tired more, couldn't focus on what needed to be done, temptations looked more appealing, I gained weight from eating comfort food, I was more irritable, more angry than normal, uh, I was exercising less and less, nothing made me happy. I was last, laughing less. I was building resentments. I reacted negatively to positive suggestions and critique. My, re my relationships were suffering in many ways, and I had this catastrophic thinking related to small health issues, you know, like, you know, one little thing happened, and I was going to die. I was planning my funeral, and everything grew negative. And I shared this with some trusted people this spring, and one of them suggested that I start to see a, 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 a psychiatrist um, and um, she has a private practice, and all she deals with is pastors and church leaders. That's how tough this job can be sometimes. And her practice is pretty full, by the way. And I saw her four or five times, and we started digging through some trauma from my childhood that I didn't really know was there. It wasn't intentionally inflicted because trauma is not just what somebody does to us, it's also what somebody withholds from us. Some things are withheld from you, connection love, whatever. So I had these childhood traumas, and I started to discover them, and they kind of started bubbling in my thinking. And then I was off in July for my study break, and I was going to Florida because I needed to suffer for Jesus. And so I was on my way to Florida. <laughs> and um, when I, on the, as soon as I got in the car, by the time I hit uh, Windsor, I could feel this negativity starting to brew in my thinking. And as I drove and listened to Christian music, you'd think it would go away, but it didn't. It just got darker and darker and darker. And then I got there, and I was 17 days in solitude. And every day it got more negative. It got so bad and so dark. I would call Sue, and she was so worried. She said, do you know how dark and negative and anxious your thinking are? And then my, uh, Sue and my brother and sister-in-law came for the last 10 days of our vacation, and I felt more positive, so I put all this negative thinking just to being alone. I should not have been alone. That was the problem. And I kind of said, oh, okay, we're done. On we go. And I returned and headed back to Lakeside to work, and I, I, I was looking forward to it. I was so excited about being back. And, and, and the first day was great. I had a great day, kind of re-entering. And second day, staff management team went away. We had a great day, awesome day. And I went home, and that night, I had a panic attack like I have never happened, had before. My chest was pounding like my heart was coming up my throat. I could hardly breathe. My arms were numb and sore. My fingers tingled. My tongue and my mouth were on fire. Um, I felt so overwhelmed and so to control. And so I did some stuff to kind of, you know, uh, deal with it and, you know, wipe the sweat off because I broke out into these sweats. And um, I kind of mopped myself up and found my way back to sleep. And, um, and I thought, oh, you know what, it's a one-night thing. Who, you know, whatever. Went to work the next day. As I went through the day, I could feel myself getting more anxious. Wouldn't you know it, that same night, next night, same panic, attack, same panic attack, same kind of ideas. That went on for a couple of days, and uh, uh, Friday I went to see some friends for dinner, and we left early because I couldn't handle it, and Saturday I, I went to a wedding, and I, I had to leave early because I was just feeling so overwhelmed, and that night, it was a Saturday night, I slept for like three hours, and then I had to get up and speak on Sunday morning, and because of the grace and the mercy and strength of God, I got through that. I took Monday off, but I thought taking a day off, maybe that'll help, but that night the panic attacks were far worse than they'd ever been. Slept for a couple of hours, and I woke up in the morning, and I thought, oh, man, I've got the worst flu I have ever had. It was awful. Every part of my body ached. I felt nauseous. I felt like I wanted to throw up. My head was aching. I was dizzy. It was awful. So I did something I've never done in 17 years at Lakeside. Took a sick day. First one. First sick day in 17 years. That'll tell you about part of my problem right there. And uh, so I took a sick day. I thought I'd sleep through the day and kind of get myself back together. I had a leadership team meeting that night. Couldn't make it. Could not make the meeting. And uh, it wasn't great. And so I, you know, I thought, okay, I'll try to sleep. And I didn't sleep really well, a couple hours maybe. I got up, got showered, thought maybe that would wake me up. Came in, sat at my desk. It was a Wednesday. I'll never forget it. It was on a Wednesday. I sat at my desk. And I was trying to prepare a message. And I would read what was on the book and I couldn't comprehend what I was reading, and I'd take a line and I tried to write it on my note page, and I couldn't even write it. And I, I couldn't think, and I couldn't comprehend, I couldn't make a decision, I was sweating, I was shaking, I felt just awful. So I couple, called a couple of staff uh, members uh, into my office and said, listen, something's really wrong, I gotta take some time off. I don't know how long that's gonna be, but 
I'm a mess. I am a mess. And I emailed the leadership team right away and told them what was going on and said, I've got to take some time off. For the next 10 days, I was totally incapacitated. I couldn't read, write, think, make decisions. I didn't even feel confident driving. Sue knew I was sick because I let her drive. <laughs> I didn't want to go out. And for the first few days, I sat in my favorite spot looking at my large screen TV, and I watched TV for 12 to 15 hours. Thank goodness the Olympics were on because there was something worth watching. And on the Wednesday, I was, as time went on 10 days later, um, every night was some form of panic. Every night was maybe two hours sleep, and it wasn't two together. It was a half hour awake for a while, half hour, 45 minutes awake, and it was that pattern. It went on for 10 days till I was absolutely, totally incapacitated. And on the Wednesday, I was scheduled to see the psychiatrist, but I hadn't sleep at all at night, so about three in the morning, I said to her, I can't come in, I can't drive, I'm, I can't do this, I can't be there, I can't go through this. And uh, she wrote me an email at 8.15 in the morning, I remember it, and she said, um, I'm clearing my schedule this afternoon, and I need to have you there. And it was said with capital letters, so I knew she meant it. And then I showed up, and my doctor had already prescribed anxiety meds, but I only wanted the smallest dose. In fact, I didn't really want to take them, but I, I agreed to. And I arrived at her office, and she talked about me getting physically well, and she talked about, you know, increasing my meds and taking some meds to sleep, and I was very, very resistant. I said, no, no, I don't need that. It's got to be another way. And she said to me, you're not getting out of here until you agree to take meds. And I went, yeah. And I started to push back, and she pushed back harder, and a few of you know her, and you know what that can be like. And finally, I wanted to go home, so I said, I agree, and I took the prescription. That was the darkest day of my entire life. I never felt so hopeless and so uncertain about my future. I never thought I, whether I'd, I didn't know whether I'd come back to ministry or not. I didn't know. Over the next few weeks, though, there was this miraculous change, and it was miraculous. And I have to give God all the credit because it happened way faster than it should have. I started sleeping well. I started feeling better. I was more cognitive, more functional. My mood improved. I felt this growing hope. And so I had dealt with the physical part, but I knew I had about a year-long journey or longer to deal with what got me there and the emotional part, and I needed to sort that out. And I slowly started to move out of the fog. That's how I called it. I, I moved out of the fog, and I started exercising daily. And I, um, I do this breath, you know, breathing to kind of calm me down, and I've been eating better and sleeping well and lost most of the weight I've gained and um, exercise and all those kind of things. And as I was going through this, this darkest time of my life, it was this passage in Philippians that got me through it. And so I'm just going to read it, and I'm going to share five simple things that I found in this passage that helped me out of the fog. Now, I know that your struggle might not be as deep and dark as mine, but wherever you are on the continuum with anxiety and worry and fear, I know these principles can help. I really do. So let's read the passage. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And I read this in my darkest days, and I read rejoice in the Lord always, and I said, oh yeah, Paul, sure, you don't know what I'm going through. And he said, oh yeah, and I say it again, rejoice. Like, I know how hard it is. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The word gentleness there is the way you treat other people because of what's going on in you emotionally. That's what the word means. So it, it, you have to be careful of when you're, you're kind of emotionally messed up, how you treat others. And then he said, the Lord is near. And then he says these words, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. And what you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. So, here's what I learned. I think it can help you too. Number one, we have to experience the presence of God. You've got to. What does he say? The Lord is near. Now, here's the deal. Intellectually, I know God was present. Theologically, I know God would never leave me nor forsake me. But emotionally, in the core being of who I was, I had not experienced that in a long time. And I needed to have a greater experience, not a greater head knowledge or cliches. I needed to experience it emotionally in the depth of my soul. 
I knew he was there, but I couldn't feel it. And I would listen, and, and, and where, I, where I started to kind of sense the presence of God was in the middle of the night when I was awake, and it was dark, and it was lonely. And in those times, I would listen to worship songs that reminded me of God's presence and God's love and God's grace and hope. But there was one song in particular that I listened to over and over again. Some nights I listened to it a dozen times. And the song is called, I Am Not Alone by Carrie Job. And some of the lyrics go, when you go through deep water, standing in the fire, through the valley of the shadow, facing deep sorrow, when the dark night overtakes you, and then she sings this song, I'm not alone, I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. And then I would read Scripture of God's promises that He would never leave me or forsake me, that nothing separated me from His love. I would write in my journal, and I would cry out to God, literally tears, cried out to God and said, God, I just want to feel Your presence. And then one night, the lightning bolt came, and I felt it miraculously. Not. It's not how it happened. Slowly and subtly, I felt a little bit more of God's presence every day, every night. I felt more of it. And I realized, you know why I had not experienced it? Because I had been hydroplaning over life. And I learned that you only really notice the presence of God in the quiet, in the solitude, in the stillness, in the worship of God in private. And I had been so busy, I hadn't slowed down long enough, found solitude enough to really experience what I knew here, here. And maybe right now, that's what you're feeling. You are feeling anxious, fearful. And you may need to slow down and find solitude and worship God and cry out for His presence and read His promises, but it's got to be done in times of solitude and quietness. I love this verse. You have made known to me the path of life. God, you show me where life can be found, and you fill me with what? Joy. You fill me with joy. How do we get it? In your presence. You fill me with joy in your presence. And if we're going to experience God's presence in a tangible way, to sense it and to feel it, we have to listen to God. We have to be still and quiet, free from distraction. I do it now, not in the place I normally do it. I used to try to sense God's presence in my office with all this work around me. Don't do it there anymore. And part of finding my way out of the fog is experiencing the presence of God. The second thing was a prayer that led to peace. There's a prayer that leads to peace. And this is it. He says, do not be anxious. Now, I want to deal with that right now. Do not be anxious. I want to clear up a myth right now. This, do not be anxious, is not a command. It is an invitation. When Jesus said, don't worry, it was not a command. It is an invitation. When it says in the Bible, fear not, we say, well, that's a command. No, it's an invitation. It's an invitation. And if you struggle with fear and anxiety and worry, let me say clearly, it's not a sin because they're not commands. They are invitations from a loving and caring Father who says, come close, let's deal with these issues. Let me put my arms around you. Let me hug you and hold you. Let's deal with it. It's an invitation. And I know it's an invitation because no loving Father would say to his kids, do something that was absolutely and totally impossible. And fearing and worrying and anxiety, they're, they're impossible not to do, aren't they? And it's a father inviting us to listen, and then he gives us advice how not to be. You know, fear not is often uh, followed by, I am with you. You know how not to fear? Draw my presence. Don't worry. Jesus gives a way not to worry. It's an invitation, and then he gives a way. And Paul is the same thing. Paul says the same thing. But I'm just here to tell you, it's not a lack of faith, and it's not a sin. I've got to tell you, if somebody showed up at my door and said, David, you're a sinner because you're breaking the command of being anxious, uh, they would have had like a bruised nose because I would have just mm, done it. I really would have. He says this, don't be anxious. He invites them, don't be anxious about anything about anything, which is a pretty broad word, but in everything by prayer. He's saying, don't be anxious about anything, but pray about ev everything. Don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. 
And he invites this idea of prayer. And then he uses a couple words. The word prayer, this is the relational side of prayer. This is where I worship God, get to know God, build my relationship with God. That's what prayer is really all about. It's about confessing. It's about surrendering. It's about all of those pieces. Reminding ourselves of God's character. Dealing with the sin that's a barrier. It's a relationship building kind of piece. He says prayer and then petition. That's the asking for things word. Prayer and petition. The problem is, is too often we're spending too much time with, on petition and not enough time in prayer, and God turns into sort of a spiritual vending machine to give us our blessings, and when it doesn't happen, you know what we do? We blame God. See, before I'm going to do what I need to do, I need to get to know Him, and then I share my requests. Then I share my requests. And then He says these words, Present your request to God. The idea of present is like a present. I have my hands on the present. It's your present. I give it to you. When I give it to you, it belongs to you. It's about taking what we have and turning it over to God. It is about taking our hands of control, whatever is causing us anxiety, fear, and worry, and we hand it to God and say, you're in control. For the longest time, I tried to control the things and keep my hands on the box. I realized I had messed it up so badly. I said, God, you take control. And one of my favorite sayings these days, and some of the staff have heard me say it over and over, I am not ultimately in control. I'm not. It's hard to say that. I don't like to surrender any more than anyone else, but I have realized that I've needed to surrender. I've needed to take these requests, and I needed to present them with God and leave them in His hands and let Him work them out. And I've changed the way I prayed since August. Now, I pray in the morning, invite Jesus into my day for wisdom and guidance and, you know, filling of the Holy Spirit and surrendering, you know, at the start of each day. I do that, but What's changed the way I prayed is these things I call prayer walks. Now, I'm very blessed that where I live, we have woods all around our homes, and there's a trail, and you can, it's about three and a half miles, and you're in the woods most of the time. And I'm walking, because it's good for exercise, but I'm also praying the entire time. And it's about an hour long, and I've had to adjust my schedule to do this. This is one of the, the challenges, is when we're so busy and our schedules are so tight, these are the things we can't do. And sometimes I just pray you know, uh, uh, worship, adoration, words of adoration to God. Sometimes I'll actually sing a worship song, but I sing it quietly in case somebody comes, you know, the other way. Sometimes I pray words back to God of songs. Sometimes I pray, I pray parts of Scripture. One that I prayed almost every day is, the Lord is my shepherd, and I've dissected that over and over and over again. Um, you know what it feels like? It feels like Dad and his son walking together. That's how it feels to me. I feel God's presence. The, I, I, you know, it's just so cool to be walking like that with God. I've not experienced this ever, ever, as de the depth of this. Now, I leave so time for silence and meditation, and, you know, I sense God prompting me about weekend messages, like he said this week, share your story, about the future directions of Lakeside and issues I need wisdom for. And I'm really afraid for winter, because I'm going to have to find another way to do this, and so I just hope it's not much snow and it's pretty mild. But it's learning to pray and to get to know God, and then to share what's going on in our lives, and to present these requests, to hand control over to Him. Because when we do this, look what happens when you do this. And the peace of God, that's the ultimate goal, right? Peace which brings joy, which transcends all understanding. You know what that means? You don't get it. You get peace, but you don't know why you have it, because circumstances are so awful. But you get peace anyway. And it guards. It's like a sentry on your heart and your mind. That's what happens when you pray that prayer. Now, the last three go real quick, because I know you've been wondering about that. The next one is we have to learn to be grateful. Learn to be grateful, he says, with thanksgiving. And I think that's so important in this journey is to be grateful, because it reminds me of what God has done. It reminds me of who God is. It reminds me that He hasn't stopped loving or stopped providing or stopped caring. And, and, and if God has done it in the past, and I'm grateful for what He's done in the past, it reminds me that He can do it in the future. And for me, I do it on my prayer walk. I take time to pray a prayer of thanksgiving. In fact, I've started my prayer now on my walk with thanksgiving. That's how I start it. I also do it in my journal. I'll write a list every day of the things that I'm thankful for. Because when we're grateful, it reminds us of who God is and what He has done. And it moves us from feeling hopeless to a little more hopeful. Because anxiety creates negative thinking. 
but gratitude can help move us out. And so we need to be grateful because it does something to an anxious heart. Now, this next one is going to be short, but it's huge. You have to move from negative thinking to move from negative thinking to positive, realistic, and truthful thinking. That's what you got to do. Move from negative thinking to positive, realistic, truthful. I didn't just say positive thinking. It's not the power of positive thinking. That's not what we're talking about. It's got to be realistic and it's got to be truthful. And this is what Paul says. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, what is truthful, whatever is noble, or that could be the word honest, whatever is honest, whatever is right, Whatever is pure means your mind isn't being polluted with negativity. Whatever is lovely or, or, or good, uh, whatever is admirable, something, this is about your character, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what does he say? Think about the things. He says, you want to deal with this? You've got to think positive, realistic, truthful thoughts. I've got to be honest. On my journey... The more anxious I was, the more negative my thinking was. The more negative thinking was, the more anxious I was. And I went this cycle and it just kept doing this until it got really dark. I watched my thinking. Like I had this always never thinking develop. Oh, they always hate me or they never do this or they've always been. It was just so black and white, always negative thinking. At times I became a fortune teller and I was predicting the worst outcome possible. Other times I was a mind reader. You know, I would look and say, I know what they're thinking about me. I didn't have a clue what they were thinking about me. But I would make it up, and it was never positive. And I was beating myself up with unreasonable guilt, and people had attached labels to me in the past, and I reattached them all and believed them. And I was filled with guilt and blame, and I blamed others and myself for all the negative things in my life. And it was a downward spiral. And I knew I had to change my thinking. And so I had to start becoming aware how negative thinking was really affecting me and how negative thinking was mind pollution, that it was polluting my mind and how negative thinking is usually not truthful thinking. And so this is what I do now. And I do it in my journal. I'm hoping, you know, when the fuzziness completely goes out of my brain, I'll be able to do it in my brain. But I do it in my journal right now. For example, if someone criticizes me, maybe a message I've given or they didn't like something I said, I would take the negative statement that I immediately developed because of that, and I would write what negative thought I was having. And then what I do next is I say, okay, what is the realistic, what is the truthful, what is the positive thought, and I write that out as well. So for example, you know, if someone had criticized the Sunday teaching, I would say, by the time I got home, if it was after service, I'd turn it into the worst message. Oh, that was the worst message I gave. It was so awful, so total. I'm a terrible teacher. Why do we even do this? Maybe I should do something different with my life. That's how I'd go. Now I say, hmm, okay, write that comment out. Oh, were people impacted? Well, yeah. I had some emails and some Facebook posts and um, you know, some good positive comments one-on-one, so people were still impacted. Was it my best message? I'd write no, because I knew it wasn't. Was it my worst? No, not really. But people were impacted, yeah, so I would write a positive statement. Was not my best, not my worst. People were impacted. Continue to do what you do. And i got to tell you, this has created radical change in my thinking. Radical. I do it all the time. I have days where I've got, you know, half a dozen to a dozen negative thoughts in my journal, and I've written the corresponding statement. Yeah, it takes a little bit of time. But I just want to encourage all of you who struggle with anxiety and depression, and negative thinking is plaguing you, think about this process. And if you want a little more help, I put some sheets out on the info booth. I read a book, and and some of the chapters on anxiety, anxiety and depression, and negative thinking, and how to kind of some steps out of it. I summarize it in page on the front, page on the back. You don't have to read the whole book now. Um, So if you want one of those, they're at the info booth. Finally, one last thing, we're done. I had to find the company of others who would validate my experience and provide encouragement. Now, this is for those who deeply struggle, like I do. If if it's kind of a mild form of anxiety or worry, this is probably not going to be the same. Uh, But he he says, you know, he says these words, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. In other words, there's this community, a company of others, and he says, and you do that, and the God of peace will be with you. And it gets bad. Your mind lies to you and think you're the only one, and you're the worst, and yours is the worst case. And that's where you need others to kind of come around you to say, I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. There is hope. You'll get over this. I mean, my kids have all struggled with this. Probably I'm a carrier of the disease, but they've all struggled with this. And they were so encouraging. They said, Dad, it's okay. You'll get through this. And 
Uh, there's another pastor uh, locally who uh, went through this two days before Christmas Eve last year, and he shared his journey with me, and I kind of went, okay, I'm going to be okay. Others have been okay, and I really needed that. I really needed people around me on the journey. It's really critical. It, you got to do the journey together. You can't get through these days on your own. So, that's my journey through anxiety. Yours might be different. Your worry and anxiety and, 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 and fear might be different than mine, different levels, you're somewhere different on the spectrum, but I truly believe these principles apply, that if you can rest in the reality of the presence of God and experience it and pray your way to peace, presenting your request, surrendering control, if you can learn to be grateful and change your thinking from negative to more positive, realistic, truthful thinking and find people to journey with, I know you can find your way out. Now, there's one other passage that I read during that time, and I want to read it, and I'm just going to close by reading this today. This is what it says, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. Beginning of verse 6, he says, humble yourself, therefore under God's almighty hand. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, relinquish control. Be humble enough to say, God, I'm no longer in control. I give it to you. Humble yourself. Therefore, under God's mighty hand. And guess what happens when you humble yourself and give God control? It says that he may lift you up in due time. He'll deal with it in his time. I had to learn to just say, God, here it is. I'm no longer in control. I surrender. I do this all the time now. And then it says, cast all your anxiety on him. He's really talking about like a baseball. Toss it to God. Take your anxiety and your burdens and your fears and your uncertainty and say, God, it's yours. I hand it over to you. Cast all your anxiety on him. Take your burdens and your concerns and cast it on him because he, why? Because he cares for you. Do you get that? He cares for you. That word care is one of the deepest words of affection. He cares for you. But there's a warning. The writer gives a warning. Be alert and sober-minded. Doesn't mean not drinking. It means to kind of keep focused. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. See, the evil one would love to destroy you in one of the best ways he can is through anxiety, worry, and fear. He says, you need to know. He wants to devour you. He wants to eat you up. He says, resist him. How do you resist him? By standing firm in the faith. This is about the mental side of faith, what you believe. You've got to know that. He says, because you know that others throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of struggles. You're not alone. You, you get it that others are going through it. And then this verse, this just like reaches into my soul. And the God of all peace sorry, the God of all grace, the God of all grace. We've talked about the goodness and grace of God who called you to his eternal glory. We've talked about having an eternal perspective. After you've suffered a little while, after you've suffered through, because you will, he himself, who's he? God, God himself, God himself, the God of the universe is going to restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That should be great news. And then he says, to him be the power forever and ever. There is a God who says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Humble yourself and give me control. Protect yourself from the evil one who will get in your thinking and mess you up. Know that you're not alone in the journey and that I will restore you. I will help you stand firm. I will help you find your way. Let's pray together. And so, Father God, today, I just pray for those who are wrestling to varying degrees with anxiety right now here in this place, that you would give them just a sense of your presence. I think some people need to hear, just feel it a little bit today, Lord. So may they know your presence through your Holy Spirit. Pray that there will be those who choose today to take those concerns and those worries and say, hands off, no control, handing it to you. I pray for those who need restoration because they're badly broken those who have been restored, that they would be an encouragement to those who are broken. But Father, that you would help us to find joy and peace because that's the way you want us to live. And so Father, we hear your invitation and many of us choose today to, to accept it and to not be anxious or at least try not to be and to make our journey towards peace and joy. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this message. To hear it again or other messages, please visit us at lakesidechurch.ca.